the Thracian coast has been an area that attracted the interest of settlers from a very early time. The long excavational history of sites such as Maronia and Zoni have produced some impressive finds, and the inception more recently of the Perea of Summer Thrace project doubles down on the historical importance of the region. It is noteworthy, however, that when it comes to the study of pottery uh, of the late classical or Hellenistic periods uh, later on from that area, modern research has not demonstrated so far the same kind of zeal. Only a small number of papers has appeared so far in the bibliography. Uh, this paper thus uh, aspires to offer a partial remedy to this situation by presenting an extensive pottery assemblage from the ancient city of Maronia. The ceramic assemblage under investigation derives from a clearly defined context that is a house in the Fragidis plot in the Campana area, which coincided with the eastern part of the walled city, about 300 meters to the southwest of the theater. Although the house has not been excavated in, in its entirety, its revealed portion is enough to set light on its architectural form. In a typical uh, for the city fashion, it is organized around a central courtyard. The discovered Andron included a badly preserved mosaic. Noteworthy is the presence in the courtyard of a hearth, hearth, as well as a pit, where much of the voluminous pottery presented here came from. Expectedly enough, the largest portion of it course concerns courseware and cookingware. The diagnostic pottery, however, reveals a different, although misleading, picture since it is dominated by tableware. Further, oil containers and toilet vessels show up in a much smaller numbers of a uh, number of examples. The assemblage is complemented by a few lamps and incense burners. The earliest chronological limit of the assemblage is placed in the 4th century BC, and in particular its second quarter. The lifespan of the house, however, stretches all the way to around the middle of the 2nd century BC. Hence, the holistic examination of this pottery is, in my opinion, imperative if we are to trace the ceramic identity of the city and investigate its diachronic significance for the local production. Regarding tableware, their high occurrence within the diagnostic pottery does not coincide with an equally large variety of shapes. Furthermore, the repetition of certain shapes is clear. They can be divided into three large groups, drink cups, vessels for pouring and for wine service, and vessels for food service. Cantharoi, in various varieties, are clearly the most common type of drinking vessels. Among them, cantharoi of the classical type, and in particular, the variety with a plain ring, appear to have been the most popular. Most examples are covered by a rather dull black glaze, but in a few cases, the glaze takes on uh, a red to brown hue. There is, however, at least one example sporting a molded ring. Another visible variety is that of the Hellenistic type cantharos, recognized in several fragmented examples. Previous research has already established that this type is common in Maronia and is represented by two subtypes, an angular and an S-shaped one. Both subtypes uh, serve a low, molded, well-defined ring base, a pair of strap handles with rotels, and an outturned ring. The form of the body obviously differs, being angular in one subtype and bulging in the other. The presence, however, of both of a, on both of a shallow groove at about the middle of the body reveals their typological affinity. Sadly, the assemblage produced no fully preserved examples of either subtype. The angular subtype is secure, securely attested by at least one example, while the numerous recorded fragments from bases and handles with hotels can be attributed to either subtype. Several areas, such as Athens and Eritrea, offer also examples of the angular subtype. The presence, though, of West Slope decoration and the absence of hotels from the handles distinguishes them from the Maronian examples. Further, quite close parallels to the S shaped subtype are traced in neighboring to Maronia areas, such as Samothrace, Eastern Macedonia, Ilion, and mainly Pergamon. The third attested cantharos type concerns a probably local variation of the one piece cantharos, which is attested via two examples. Despite missing any thumb rests and moldings, these examples clearly follow the basic morphological features of the one piece cantharos, whose, whose origin is considered to be Corinthian. It is worth noting, however, that these vases are treated as coursewares with their reeds in inclusions and mica clay in the absence of any glaze or slip. Surprising is the slender presence of bolsal skiphoi and hemispherical caps 
represented by only one example each. Poor investors now, and those for one service, on the other hand, uh, present a much greater variety. Noteworthy is the almost fully preserved crater with lung handles, as it represents a rather uncommon type of crater. It is characterized by a wide, wide ring base, hemispherical body, an overhanging ring, and of course a pair of handles in the shape of an inverted U. Although most of the published examples from other sites, such as Pergamon, feature west slope decoration on the rim, the example from Maronia remains undecorated. The discovery of at least two more lag handled craters in residential context of Maronia clearly illustrates a local preference as well as the presence of symbolic events. This base category, however, is dominated by Jacks. The fragmentary state of preservation does not allow the delineation of typologies and their chronological succession. Uh, the best preserved, though, among them allow the identification of at least two varieties. The first, uh, which you can see on the screen, coincides for the most part with <coughs> Rotrox Form 1, sports a low ring base, an ovoid, short body, and a cylindrical neck ending on an outwardly triangular rim. The second can be identified with Rotrox Form 3 by its featured high swung handle. Special emphasis deserve also the Hellenistic table lithoi, which are considered derivatives of the Black Dayanera lithos of the archaic and classical periods. Only a few sites, such as Athens, New Alos, Eretria, and Lefkada, have offered substantial numbers of this base type, whose basic features include a ring foot, a globular or ovoid body, a thin neck, a strap handle, and an either broad and sallow or bell-shaped mouth. The last category of tableware, namely vessels for food service, is expectantly dominated by small bowls and plates in various types. They are joined by only a few examples of one handlers and salt sellers. As far as small bowls are concerned, the two subtypes reflected in the material at hand are small bowls with a curved rim, which are the most popular by far, and those with an outturned rim. Both subtypes usually bear glaze, which ranges from black to red or brown, and typically covers the interior and only the upper part of the exterior surface. It is usually dull and of bad to mediocre quality. In this case, too, however, unglazed examples are not missing. Expectedly, plates have a prominent place within the category of vessels for food service. Several types can be identified, including plates with rolled rings, saucers, and more prominently, fish plates, which are attested both by their late classical and Hellenistic terraces. Hellenistic fish plates, in particular, comprise the most commonly found variety of plates. Despite their numbers, though, tracing the development of the shape is quite challenging. This difficulty is explained by several factors. First, most of the examples do not retain enough of their profile. And secondly, the diversity and particularities of the different types of fish plates in different areas around Greece often indicate a different pace in the morphological progress per area. The fact that no good published parallels can be found for most Maronian examples only corroborates that view. Finally, stratigraphical remarks are of no particular help either, since most of these fish plates derive from the same layer or the one immediately above. In any case, the chronological indications provided by other datable shapes within these layers concern only a short period of time, that is the first quarter of the third century BC, which seems like a short period for the morphological divergences observed, and which concern the size of the base, the curvature and depth of the body, and the diameter of the central depression. Course were comprise the next large category of vessels. Only a small array of shapes can be observed. Trade down for us, mostly from Thassos, but also from Acanthos, Rhodes, and Knidos dominate this category. Lacana, though, have an impressive presence too. Finally, mortars are also visible, while fragments from pithoi and staminoid vases are rare. Taking a closer look at Lacana, four main varieties can be identified. The first two feature a projecting rim, and their differentiating factor is the form of the body, which can be either hemispherical or almost conical and deep. Whenever there are indications for the food, food, this appears to have been a narrow ring one. The third variety concerns a shallower but larger ceramic form with a rather wide ring base, a shallow, slightly convex body, and a less projecting rim. 
Finally, another, another type with possible parallels in thasos concerns a large conical body and a large projecting rim on top of which are placed two horizontal handles. The slow typological changes observed for this vessel type make their close dating difficult. Moving on to cooking ware, uh, these are not as numerous as coarse ware, but they nevertheless have a strong presence within the pottery assemblage. The variety of shapes is again rather limited. Hitre and Lopades antagonize each other in this informal popularity contest, which ends in almost a tie. An important note concerning Hitre is that they seem to appear almost exclusively through the one handled version, although in a variety of profiles. Two handled Hitre are attested with certainly only once, through an example with double vertical handles and a ring that forms a receptacle in the interior for the reception of the lid. Uh, suddenly, I have no uh, drawing or picture for this one. If this discrepancy between one handled and two handled Hitre is not accidental, then it might provide indications in relation to the size and or number of meals that the Maronians used to have. A less expected, however, type of hydroid vase, which is identified in a couple of occasions, concerns handmade vessels. Uh, in these examples, if these examples represent the exact same ceramic form, then this should be described as having a flat resting surface, a deep ovoid or slightly angular body, uh, in the upper part, part of which relief decoration might exist, and lag handles. Based on previous observations on handmade pottery found in Maronia and neighboring areas of Thrace and Eastern Macedonia, Hitroid vases could be ascribed to the Thracian pottery tradition. Lopates, on the other hand, reveal an impressive uniformity in their form. Almost all appear to belong to the same type with upturned handles, rather shallow body and rounded bottom. The only variation comes from an example that sports a much deeper body. The number of leads which have been identified in the material can most probably be associated with the Lopade. On the contrary, the sole example of a cooking stand identified through only one of its legs could be utilized in conjunction with both Hitre and Lopades. Further, the form of both vase types presents a marked stability throughout the centuries, and therefore they can be associated with any of the phases of the house under discussion, which are going to be discussed uh, later on. However, the last piece of formation concerning cooking ware, namely a pan, might tell a different story. It is about a pan which is placed within rotors form one with plain handle. The lifespan of this type, at least in the Agora of Athens, starts no later than 180 BC. Therefore, this vase can quite possibly be associated with the last phase of the house. Finally, the assemblage complement a few examples of Pixides, like Anis, Goody, Nguentaria, as well as a few lamps and a couple of incense burners. The largest portion of the pottery under consideration can be ascribed to the output of local pottery workshops. This view is supported by the relative uniformity of the fabrics observed. As far as tableware are concerned, two fabrics appear with higher frequency. The first is rich in mica and small lime inclusions, while it has a reddish yellow color. The second fabric is, uh, appear, appears finer with an equally large amount of mica and a pink hue. As mentioned before, the glaze on most vases is of poor quality and mostly fugitive. Its color ranges from black to red to brown and in vases such as small bowls and possibly ochre cover only partly the external surface. Further, most courseware serve fabric with a few small limestone, inclu limestone inclusions and mica, which has a color ranging from reddish yellow to pink. Finally, the fabric of most cooking ware includes many limestone inclusions and mica and has a reddish yellow color and often turns light gray in the cold. That said, there are vases which, based on production details, <coughs> higher quality of their glaze could be considered in imports. This possibly ap applies to a couple of and plates, which can be identified as Attic products, taking into consideration, of course, the discussion we had before about reservation of using microscopic analysis as a secure uh, criteria. Uh, also, as mentioned before, uh, trade amphoras originating from Acanthos, Rhodes, Cnidos, and Thassos have been found in great numbers. It deserves emphasis here to the fact that only a relatively small portion of the tableware carries any sort of decoration. 
Thus, ruleting frequently complemented by stamped palmettes shows up on a few plates. Oddly enough, West Slope decoration is rather rare, appearing on only three cantharoi and the hemispherical bowl. Further, the cantharoi's handle is equipped with the head of an African man as a thumb rest, while painted decoration in the form of an ionic sima appears only one, once on a peliki fragment. Finally, relief decoration appears only twice on the rim of another pelike and the fragment of a lamp. This conspicuous absence of decoration, which at least in the case of West Slope is not typical for the entire city of Maronia, invites thoughts on the wealth that the owners of the house commanded. Typically, the existence of a mosaic in an ancient house, especially of considerable size, is considered criterion enough for the ascription of, the, of its owners to the well-to-do classes. Decorative pottery is often used as an equally convincing marker of wealth. The evidence, however, provided by the house under investigation tells a different story. Therefore, a consideration of this criteria might be in order. I have deliberately so far limited any discussion. This is supposed to say chronology on the top, but it's covered now. <laughs> <laughs> I have deliberately so far limited any discussion on chronology to the slightest, aiming to address this issue here. It should be noted, thus, that the establishment of ceramic chronological sequence for an area whose pottery has not been extensively researched is not a simple task. The proliferation of published material is a necessity, and the search of parallels for those vessels satisfactorily preserved must be done cautiously. The latter should not be directed only towards well-published large pottery production centers, such as Athens and Corinth or Eritrea, but must equally consider closer at home areas, the ceramic influence of which could possibly be stronger due to proximity. Following these general principles, the examination of the best preserved vessels provides the following overview for, for the ceramic output of Maronia. The first half of the fourth century BC is represented at least in the diagnostic ones that can be dated, by only a couple of vases, a deep bowl and an unglazed table amphora. Possibly dated in the second quarter of the century, they also provide the terminus post quant for the house in the Fragidis plot. The second half of the fourth century BC is reflected through a larger number of examples, such as classical type cantharoid and one handler, a couple of footed salt cellars, a couple of plates with rolled rim, and a couple of goodies. The pottery record of the transition to the 3rd century BC includes another, another one handler, an orpe, and a small bowl with a curved rim. Next, the first half of the 3rd century BC demonstrates a similar picture with more small bowls with curved rims, uh, classical type cantharoid, a footed salt cellar, plates with rolled rims, but also fish plates of both the above discussed variations. The second half of the third century BC includes some new shapes, such as the Hellenistic type cantharoi and the lag handled crate. Booty and small bowls with incurred rims are still visible, but those with an outturned rim are added now to the mix. Finally, the pottery record of the first half of the second century BC includes example, examples of saucers, the sole example of a lamp with relief decoration, and quite possibly the sole example of a pan. The study of the pottery at hand offers useful indications on the diachronic ceramic preferences of the inhabitants of this house, if not for the ceramic identity of the city in general, since the evidence presented here appears to be very similar in character and composition to the one from the only other published residential pottery assemblage from, from the city. It is, it is noteworthy that despite the large quantity of the pottery, there is a persistent repetition of certain shapes which leave little and no space for the proliferation of other shapes. As far as drinking cups are concerned, the predilection towards cantharoi, initial of the classical type and later on of the Hellenistic one, is clear. Popular elsewhere shapes for the late classical and early Hellenistic periods, though, such as bolsols, Attic type, and Corinthian type skiphoi, or the hemispherical cups for the third century BC, have either a slender presence or are totally absent. The point is further emphasized by the fact that although the house was in use until well into the second century BC, not even a sole example of a mold made bowl has been observed, detected. Pouring vessels and vessels for wine service present a greater variety, even though there is again a clear preference towards one shape, the jug. 
The seeming local importance of Table uh, Likithoi and the Lag Handle Crater has already been mentioned, while noteworthy is the absence of another important Hellenistic shape from the late 3rd century BC onwards, that is, of course, the Laginus. Concerning vessels for food service, the clear predominance of small bowls within curved rims over those with outer rims is notable. In view of this evidence, one can argue that the pottery choices of the inhabitants of this house were conditioned by a certain level of eclecticism and or conservatism. The above observations can also help us delineate the composition of the city in the wider cultural and commercial environment. The heading here reads Maronia and the others. <laughs> thus, connections with Athens and Thassos are evident for the fourth for the fourth century BC, either through imports or imitations. At the same time, though, the Attic ceramic grip does not seem to have been too tight, justifying the view of researchers <coughs> such as Elizabeth Pepperton, who has called for a reconsideration of the accepted degree of Attic ceramic influence throughout Greece. Further, the handmade Troy vases possibly signify a link with the Thrac Thracian pottery tradition. Then, during the Hellenistic period, conducts intensified. The similarities and divergences, however, from the most commonly found shapes elsewhere, speak for a participation of the city in the Hellenistic ceramic economy in a distinctive and selective manner. Even more so, the presence of S-shaped cantharoi with similar form and other similarities not noted here between Maronia and neighboring areas such as Drama, Samothrace, Pergamon, and Ilion enable us to speak of a local ceramic dialect. It is up to future research to confirm or not these conclusions and complete the picture of the ceramic identity of Maronia via the publication of more pottery assemblages from the city. Thank you very much. <laughs>